As the headline says, review bombs are a myth, at least for the most part. Welcome back to Otaku Daikun. I'm Dai Chan Alter, and today we're going to be discussing the concept of review bombing. I'm sure you've heard the term before, especially from content platforms and journalists who try to claim that a sudden influx of audience ratings is nothing but the work of malicious trolls. While review bombing is a real thing, just like the G Spot, that doesn't mean these sources are being honest when they moan about it. In other words, these climaxes are fake. In the vast majority of cases, when you hear the term review bomb, it should be considered a major red flag, a sign that mainstream media is feeling threatened by user feedback. I'll be exposing all their lies so that you can see them in the buff, and unlike me, it's not pretty. If you enjoy this channel, be sure to like, comment, share, and smash that subscription bell as if it were your waifu. You can support us by becoming a generous channel member, or joining our Subscribestar or Patreon. All three platforms offer perks such as early access and exclusive content that's too spicy for YouTube. You're gonna want in, as soon I'll be releasing a special sapphic doujinshi that you won't find anywhere else. Certainly not from the digital thieves over at Autumn Games. Now, if you bother to look it up, a review bomb describes an organized movement of users who maliciously take to an online platform to spam a work of media with reviews or ratings. It's assumed that, rather than accurately reflecting public opinion, these reviews are designed to slander or unfairly hurt a service's reputation or sales. To be fair, this is definitely the case whenever you see the same users making multiple accounts or relying on bots to inflate statistics. This does occur, which is why it infuriates me when platform holders bust it out prematurely. The catalyst for our discussion is, of course, the drama surrounding Skullgirls. It's an edgy fighting game that's been around for over a decade now. While the game was well received at launch, drama surged throughout the dev team, causing Skullgirls to be taken over by a new batch of creators, Hidden Variable Studios. In the years following its initial release, various changes were made to in-game assets, such as lengthening skirts to avoid panty shots. Most recently, however, they unleashed the biggest batch of changes, censoring in-game CGs, sprites, and even the digital art book released years prior. These changes addressed two things. First, they removed Nazi imagery, mainly the red armbands worn by several characters. Beyond the principle of the thing, I couldn't care less about this. I don't exactly get people's fetish with World War II Germany, though I find it suspicious how it's taken the team so long to finally deem it a problem. It's not as though Skullgirls was duping players into its aesthetic, nor was it ever approving of the Nazi campaign. Anyway, the much bigger issue was their censorship of sexy stuff. The dev cited that because it had a 16-year-old girl, as well as various non-consensual encounters in the story mode, they felt it necessary to cover up many of the assets. Like, literally. Skirts got magically longer, white panties changed to black shorts, and torn clothing was restored to full durability. Hmm. <laughs> as for the whole consent thing, it mainly refers to tentacle CGs, where the characters are still being suspended by tendrils, but now those tendrils are longer, or more numerous, in order to avoid showing the people grabbed by them. You'd think more would be better, but not when they block your view. I can only imagine their rationale is that it's okay to put characters in compromising situations, so long as players don't enjoy it. At that point, why even bother? To clarify my stance, Skullgirls is a fanservice game. It knew what it was, and wasn't ashamed of it, no matter how politically incorrect it got. The game grew a fan base of players that wanted its edgy aesthetic, so condemning those design choices equally condemns the players that supported the game for all of these years. Let's be real, fighting games are a dime a dozen, and it's often the cosmetic details that set them apart. Fans had other games they could play that were safe for work, but chose Skullgirls for what made it special. 
Now, regardless of whether these changes bother you or not, one thing is undeniably certain. They constitute a blatant case of digital theft. I'm sure those devs have a slimy legal team to get them out of trouble. But no matter what the laws say, this is the digital equivalent to having people break into your home and violate your property. It's a bitter reminder that when you purchase something digital, so long as it's tied to DRM, you don't truly own it. Updates will always exist, for better or worse, and unless you can archive those older versions, there's nothing you can do to stop them. We're already used to fighting games changing all the time, with balance adjustments, bug fixes, and even extra features, but it's shocking to see updates alter or remove art assets. Many suspect that Hidden Variable pumped out these changes to appeal to the eSports crowd, as shortly after their patch, they announced a return to EVO. Personally, I feel that EVO is the death of fighting games. Sexy designs and single-player modes have really fallen off since devs started prioritizing family-friendly tournaments. Because every new fighter is expected to rely on eSports, there's no longer any motive to create mature games. It's especially frustrating when the people condemning sexy characters often have skeletons in their closet, things that are far worse than a bit of TNA. Of course, an easy fix for devs would be to either sell a separate eSports version of a game or put a toggle switch in the options mode to censor content. You'd think this to be a perfect solution, but now I see why we can't have nice things. Recently, fighting game tournament Corner to Corner made a blunder when, in one of their Street Fighter VI matches, Chun-Li appeared on screen in the nude. Oh yeah. These incompetent imbeciles forgot to turn off mods before their public broadcast. This reeks of the time that Tifa's tatas were accidentally shown off to the Italian Senate. Obviously, if tournament hosts can't be bothered to test for this sort of thing in advance, it's no surprise they can't be trusted with something as idiot-proof as a censorship mode in the options. This must be why, in Grand Blue Fantasy Versus, you can only de-censor the game after first completing its entire story mode. The Skullgirls issue runs deeper, though, deep enough to go all the way through, if you know what I mean. If eSports were their endgame, the devs would only need to alter the game itself, but they went so far as to modify the game's digital art book as well. To me, this is the most egregious part. Seriously, imagine someone busting down your door and taking a big black marker to all of your raunchy manga. I can't believe devs can get away with this. It proves they both resent their IP and their own longtime customers. They must be frothing at the mouth, shrieking to the heavens realizing that people like us enjoy panties or fictional non-con. After all the drama I just mentioned, it's no wonder that fans would take to Steam's review portal to express their concerns. In just a couple of weeks, the game was hit with thousands of negative reviews from players who don't appreciate being robbed or deceived. Before long, the game's Steam page displayed an overwhelmingly negative score from recent reviews. Just a bit later, though, that score went back up to very positive. What's that about? Well, turns out that Steam had flagged all those reviews as off-topic, which both hides them from view and doesn't factor them into the ranking system. You could only find these reviews by changing your settings, which most people don't do. Apparently, this is Steam's way of fighting review bombing. I'm not sure who sucked off who to make this happen, but it's likely that Hidden Variable and Steam teamed up to suppress their negative feedback. Games journalist Polygon also declared these reviews to be a review bomb, siding with the devs for changing the game. Here's the thing, though. These were all genuine reviews. This wasn't a review bomb at all. What does an off-topic review even refer to? Perhaps something like, My dog just died, therefore I can't enjoy this video game. It's a lot like when anime feminist slandered Akibi's sailor uniform by going off on an unrelated tangent about manga authors being arrested for CP. I imagine it's quite hard to write an off-topic review. As long as it's something about the game itself, you can like or dislike it for any reason. You can denounce an otherwise amazing game because it has just one annoying voice actor. You can downvote a game because it won't let you put a massive eggplant on a woman. Or because you can. These may not make for the most helpful reviews, but they do represent people's actual feelings. Of all the petty things people are allowed to complain about, I can't imagine a better reason to denounce a game than this. 
They took something you bought and should rightfully own, then changed it right from under you. They specifically removed or altered details in the game that were genuine features that lured in players from the start. Angry reviews are the least they should receive, with the next step being to issue refunds. Luckily, I've been told Steam fixed this issue, allowing all of those off-topic reviewers to continue dragging down Skullgirl's recent score. But the fact that they were suppressed at all is concerning. If this wasn't a review bomb, why did news and gaming outlets treat it like one? That answer's pretty simple. They feel threatened. You see, way back before the internet, mainstream media had the world's balls and a vice grip. Film studios could use five-star reviews to create a false sense of what was hot and exciting. Movie critics were part of this, getting paid to write positive or scathing reviews to control the industry's agenda. That aspect of journalism hasn't really changed. Whether review sites are getting paid by studios to write their reviews, or they need to suck up to the industry for exclusive access and perks, their critiques amount to little more than extended advertisements. They don't help you find what you'll enjoy, they feed you an illusion of what they think you should enjoy. Thus, the advent of user-submitted scores and reviews has really helped critical discourse, providing an alternative to official critics. The discrepancy between critic and audience scores are as plain as day, thanks to sites like Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, or in this case, Steam reviews. Oftentimes, these sites implement audience scores as a feature to bring in more users, but sometimes those scores threaten them. It seems platforms are willing to humor audience feedback, that is, until it goes against their narrative. Perhaps the most glaring example of this came when YouTube decided to remove the public dislike count for videos. Around 2016, online culture had a revolution of sorts, in which fans gained a sense for corporate pandering. When terrible films or games nobody asked for would find their way to the YouTube trending tab, we the people responded in kind. We got sick and tired of the YouTube rewinds, which were just bona fide pep rallies. We lost patience for big-time celebrities like Brie Larson trying to act relatable in vlogs, only to hog the top spots in YouTube's algorithm while smaller, more organic creators suffer. Because YouTube sold itself out to mainstream media, it had a responsibility to appease them when they complained about all their projects having way more downvotes than likes. YouTube's solution was simple, just stop displaying how often a video is disliked. Publicly, they declared they were combating malicious review bombing, but pretty much everyone saw what was truly going on. Now, they can shove out whatever AAA crap they want, and to the untrained eye, it'll look like we're eating it right up without issue. Review bombing has become a convenient excuse for these companies to write off criticism. Again, this sucks incredibly hard, because there are actual cases of review bombing. Bots, for example, are a plague upon the internet, creating false metrics with ease. When it comes to anime, perhaps its most nefarious review bomb came from the YouTuber Nuxtaku. The dude's always been a troll, but stoked a lot of attention when he rallied his viewers to flood to my anime list and upvote Ishuzoku reviewers. His goal was to see if he could get the anime to the top spot in the rankings, and he managed to land it in second place for a time. I admit, this kind of excited me back then, given how Funimation had just dropped their localization of the anime for not adhering to their standards. There were valid protests to be had, but Nux's stunt wasn't one of them. He was the perfect example of why review bombing is dangerous. It wasn't how Nux brought attention to the anime that mattered. Virality, in its own way, can be an organic process. Had Nux simply showed off the series and told people to flock to my anime list with their honest opinions, it would have been fine. Instead, he had them abuse the review system to artificially boost Ishizoku higher in the rankings. While I'm sure there are people out there who believe the anime truly deserves a perfect 10, I'm confident the majority of votes came from people who just wanted to see it at the top, regardless of whether it was truly superior to the others up there. Nux made joke that this was exactly what Mal was made for, but we all know that's untrue. What made this a review bomb was also what made it so malicious. It was a campaign meant to misrepresent the genuine opinions of anime fans. 
It wasn't the influx of reviews, but the motive and intention behind them that mattered. Hopefully you can see something truly ironic come from all of this. If it's so bad to manipulate statistics, why does mainstream media get away with doing exactly that all the time? By curating feedback, paying off critics, and suppressing audience scores, they're doing exactly what Nux did. While you can't exactly call it a review bomb, what these companies are doing shares the same core issue that review bombing presents. The point of bringing this all up is to help you be more aware. The next time you find an article mention review bombing, be very skeptical. Something tells me that if you look a little deeper into it, you'll find that what's being condemned as a review bomb is actually just a sudden influx of valid opinions. Because those opinions serve to threaten the mainstream media's narrative, it's all too easy to just write them off as a review bomb. And so long as we suck that teat, companies will get away with it. There are actual review bombs, but I highly encourage you all to be more hesitant when they emerge. That leaves me wondering about what you all think. Do you consider Skullgirls to be better or worse off with its censorship? Do you think devs should have a legal right to censor content you've already purchased? More importantly, do you feel the game was actually review bombed, or was that term merely invoked to suppress contrasting opinions? Be sure to go down on those comments with your juicy thoughts. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy this channel, help us grow by liking, commenting, sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and most of all, smashing that notification bell so you don't miss out on all of our anime discussion, lore, or let's play content. You can support us directly through Patreon, Subscribestar, or our YouTube membership, all of which come with benefits like exclusive vids and early access. As always, celebrate, celebrate your, your fandom! fandom. I want to give a special shout out to all my $10 and up supporters. Videogamer75, Steven Elak, Samuel Gersten, The Nonchalant Ostrich, Otaku Mom, Jens Bauman, Mystic Samurai 1983, Lord Omagodem, Free Brick, Olympian Doll, Alexis Yukio Gomez Yamato, Link Pendrago, Observer Bellis, King Kobo, James Hewitt, Uncanny EXP, Andre Foster, Jared Krause, Yukie Eros, Sogai CH, Caitlin P, Vladimirovna, Jonathan Padua, The Taz 96, Kengo X 77, Alistair Bernadotte, and Akakaze Yume. Thank you all so much.